This time on Gadget Show Web TV, John's bringing the cinema home with him with his 21 by 9 TV from Philips. I'll be getting you up to speed with the latest gadget news, and then I'm taking to the virtual skies with the iPilot flight simulator. Chocks away! and welcome to this week's episode of Web TV. Now, don't worry, your eyes aren't deceiving you. I'm not Dion, I'm indeed Amy. But while Dee's managed to grab a week's holiday, they've asked me to hold the fort here at Gadget Towers. Brilliant! So, first up, John's chilling out, relaxing, and taking a look at the enormous 56-inch ultra-widescreen TV by Philips. Lucky man. Increasing numbers of DVD and Blu-ray discs are being released as the director intended, showing you the whole of the movie frame. Like most films made since the 1970s, this Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull was originally shot in something close to 21 by 9 ultra widescreen format. It's how you'd see it at the cinema. And this Blu-ray release, out now from Paramount Pictures, is faithful to that. It shows you the whole of the frame. Unfortunately, this means that when you play it back on a widescreen TV, with a slightly taller format, you get bars at the top and bottom of the screen, because it's only 16 by 9. Now, a lot of people are really rather unhappy with this. They say, I've bought a widescreen TV, and yet when I play my movies, I'm still seeing bars at the top and bottom of the screen. Well, Philips have come up with a solution. It's an ultra widescreen 21 by 9 TV, specially designed for showing movies. And here it is. And what a jolly impressive TV it makes. That's a 56 inch screen, no less, with 1080 by 2560 pixels, giving you 8.1 megapixels in all. And it's a hugely involving movie experience. Great colours, great contrast, and the picture genuinely does fill the screen. Now, the involvement's also helped by the latest iteration of Philips' excellent Ambilight system. LEDs behind the screen project light onto the wall behind the TV, complementing the colours on the picture. Different colours for different parts of the screen. It really does seem to extend the movie into the room. Philips have also worked overtime on their picture processing technology. It's 200 hertz with perfect natural motion. What this does is analyse the frames in the movie and then creates extra frames in between, all different, that smooth out the motion and sharpen the picture. Sometimes it works very well on this movement of cars, it smooths them out and you get sharper pictures of the cars. But in other areas, when the action gets fast, I don't think it can entirely cope. You get pixelation in the picture where you don't expect it. And overall, the smooth motion gives you almost like an exaggerated steady cam effect, which personally I find very slightly dizzying. There's no doubt this system is very sophisticated, but personally it's not to my taste. I think I'd be inclined to leave it off. Of course, not all movies are ultra-wide 21 by 9. Quite a few are still 16 by 9, as is most telly. And also, there's still quite a bit of telly that's old-fashioned 4 by 3. Now, if you're watching 16 by 9 in its correct aspect ratio on this, effectively you've only got a 42-inch screen. The TV does its best to handle all these formats with an auto-format feature, but I think you'll find yourself reaching quite often for the format button on the remote. This allows you to select precisely the degree of stretch and zoom to suit your tastes. Now, obviously, the screen makes most sense if you watch movies most of the time. Another aspect of personal taste comes in, I think, as to whether you really like pillar boxing or letter boxing best. Are you a pillar boxing or a letter boxing sort of person? I actually find the bars at the side of the screen quite irritating. I feel I'm getting slightly less. It comes with a USB socket and wired and Wi-Fi internet connectivity. There's a basic web browser and widgets to do things like browse YouTube, or listen to the world's internet radio. Now, because for its size it's not quite as tall as a conventional widescreen telly, it's not so overpowering in the room, which is a good thing. On the negative side, though, the remote isn't terribly responsive. The sound isn't that brilliant through the internal speakers. I found it really quite short on mid-range. And, of course, it is really rather expensive. In spite of all that, though, I really like this TV. Philips are coming to collect it tomorrow, sadly and I shall definitely miss it.
TomTom are releasing a sat-nav application for the iPhone, complete with a dashboard docking station that will enable you to charge the phone at the same time as using it for navigation. Although sat-nav applications do already exist for the iPhone, like the Navigon, TomTom are the first big-named company to come out with an application that uses turn-by-turn -turn navigation. It will have Europe-wide mapping, and I think it could be a serious contender for the soon-to-be-released Garmin Nuvi phone. Unfortunately, there's no release date or price for the application yet. It's simply listed as coming out this summer. There have been rumours of a mini version of the Nokia N97 smartphone. Now, these rumours have recently become more credible due to further details about the phones being leaked. The reduced version is thought to have similar specs to the Nokia 5530XM. The slim down memory will either be 8 or 16 gigabytes rather than 32. It'll have no camera lens cover and it'll have a smaller keypad. The phone is expected to make an appearance at the Nokia World Conference this September in Stuttgart, with approximately £80 knocked off the original N97 price. Now, we've heard that Nokia themselves may have leaked this information in a cunning attempt to stop a rival company releasing a smaller version of one of their phones, also titled the Mini. Guess we'll just have to wait and see. Now, if you've ever fancied flying a jet but haven't quite got around to getting your pilot's licence, I may be able to help. I went to Blue Water in Kent to check out Europe's first shopping centre-based flight simulator. All in the name of research, of course. Hi Steve, how are you doing? My Hi name's there. Amy. Hi Amy, how are you doing? This is Steve, who's the um, qualified pilot that's going to be taking me through the flight experience. Shall we get started? Come fly with me. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> I'm actually going to have control of all of this. You will be flying this aircraft. Oh dear. So I'm in the aeroplane, I can see Heathrow in front of me. It's a huge screen, so it completely immerses you. So you looks if you are actually there. We're going to take the parking brake off, give it full power, and we're going to go down the runway. I'll monitor all our engine instruments. Yeah. I'll tell you to rotate. As you rotate, just pull back towards you. OK, so here we go. So we'll give it full throttle. Oh, it's making the actual noise that it would. OK, here we go. We're rolling down the runway. Now you're keeping it nice and straight on the runway to start pulling back. Is it an aggressive pull or slow? Or? No, just nice and straight. Up we go. Woo! We've actually taken off. I'm no longer connected to the floor, which is quite scary. Good lift off, look down here now. Yeah. Keep that about 15 degrees, perfect. Right, I'm just pulling the control column forward now to raise the nose of the aeroplane. We're in a little bit of a uh, left turn, so what we're going to do is turn the control to the right just to level the wings. Oh, gone a bit too much. Oh, turn, turn to the right and pushing forward as well. Right, I was going slightly off course, so basically I've had to turn the aircraft so that this triangle here is level with the magenta line, while still, look, I'm <laughs> doing it now, you've got to hold that at 15 degrees, so you're not climbing and you're not descending, while still kind of keeping track of the magenta line so you're heading in the right direction. Well, so far so good, I've, I've not managed to crash, which is, which is brilliant. Kind of tricks you into thinking that you genuinely are in an aircraft. Have you had anybody um, crash land yet? Everyone crash lands. <laughs> That's all right, then no pressure. We start lowering the nose. We're 11 and a half miles away. Because we're landing now, I'm kind of encouraging the nose of the aircraft downwards, so the control column's kind of being pushed forward as much as possible. Put the wings level, left turn, start pulling back. Oh, I can see the runway! Okay, we're descending too fast now, so start bringing it back. Oh, ah. oh there we see, go. warning signs, and we're to heading to the sea. Oh no, look, I'm not going to make back. it. That's it, perfect, keep pushing forward. Ah, I'm just landing! Excellent, well done, in the middle of the runway. Oh my life, I've just landed it. I've done your infamous thrusters because you're too excited. <laughs> Brilliant, I didn't crash. And we've come to a halt oh. on the runway. High five, Steve. We made it. You're the first person on the first attempt to land on the runway oh, all did you, by yourself. Did you get that on camera? First person to land in the middle of the runway. I've obviously, you know, missed out on my own vacation. Should be, where's my car? That's it now. Pilot. Well, that's it for Web TV. 
I've had a brilliant time and it's been great fun, but Dee will be back next week, hopefully with a bit of a tan, to take a look at the new HTC Hero phone. Now don't forget to keep checking the website for exclusive on-set reports from The Gadget Show. And remember, you can keep up to date with us on Twitter and become a fan of the show on our official Facebook page. This is Captain Amy, over and out.